I'm very happy that uh, we have such uh, an interesting group of uh, participants here in that panel discussion. Um, I have selectively contacted you, so to say, uh, <laughs> uh, because I think you are interesting people for that conference. And um, could you shortly explain why you confirmed to participate at this conference, at the panel discussion? And uh, why do the topics discussed at this conference matter to you? And uh, let's start with Dr. Gerhard Schick. He's the spokesman on financial policy of the German Green Party and also the founder of the NGO Finanzwende. So what's your stake on, on uh, this conference? Why did you agree to come, so to say? Um, hello, everybody. Is the microphone working? Now it is, yeah. Uh, so, hello everybody. Um, well, since I started my economic studies back in the 90s, I've always followed the discussion on the monetary system because uh, I think economists who don't understand money should, well, that is not a good thing. Um, and uh, I have tried to do that outside university because in the university classes that I had, um, there was no real discussion on the monetary system itself. So I've always tried to follow discussion in conferences like these, and uh, today I'm happy to learn more. Interesting, yeah. Um, Dr. Cyrus de la Rubia, um, con un nombre español. Um, you are the senior research manager, um, I'm sorry, no, you are the chief economist at um, Haas Ha Not Bank, which has now changed its name. and. Um, why I contacted you is why, because you published very progressive articles on both Vollgeld and on Bitcoin. So uh, why did you accept this invitation, so to say? Yeah, was it that progressive? I don't know, but um, I, I think I, uh, what, what does interest me in, in all those issues is that uh, I have the feeling that these technologies are really changing the economy in the, in the well, in the short, especially in, in the middle term, and uh, as a chief economist, I have to be aware of, of such changes, which could be quite disruptive also in for, for some sectors, not at least the financial sector. And so I'm, I'm quite happy to, to be here and um, to contribute to this discussion. And um, there's another banking, uh, uh, yeah, bam, a banker here, um, uh, Dr. Karl Christoph Hedrich, Senior Research Manager at Commerzbank. We got to know each other at an event about CBDC, actually, um, and uh, we've had a very, to me, it was very interesting, the conversation uh, about the problems of the current money system and potential uh, alternatives. So what's your stake? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this kind of introduction. Indeed, uh, yes, uh, since I think 35 years or so, I'm an old man, you see, I, I try to understand and explain to, to students or customers, whoever, what is a bank and what is money. And I never would have expected that is, that is such a, it would become such a challenging thing to, to answer these questions. And so uh, since I work for a certain bank here in Frankfurt, uh, I just have to say that the general disclaimer applies, yes. Uh, my views are expressed, but not that of Commerce Bank, but uh, also my old age provision uh, depends very much upon the further existence of banks. So, I, <laughs> of course, I'm interested in the conclusions uh, we have here. And we have one uh, academic here, um, Professor Dr. Dr. Helge Poikert. Um, he's a professor of pluralist economics at Siegen University. Um, we know each other for quite a long time uh, due to the work at Monetative. And uh, of course, I'm happy to include you, but uh, what's your opinion on that uh, uh, conference and why did you say yes to this panel discussion? Yes, in, in my view, positive money is a necessity to stop the boom-bust uh, credit cycles. And uh, uh, we, we have a, a little research project in, in Siegen on uh, cryptocurrencies. And um, I mean, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, are this the new machine dreams, uh, may be futile or not, to set a counterpoint? So positive money, you refer to Vollgeld or sovereign money, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly, Thanks. okay. <laughs> and um, uh, Ralf Berliger, um, you are a banking consultant at a uh, major consultant firm here, Bearing Point in Frankfurt, and you write about cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technology, and you are also a fellow at uh, Mises Institute. And So why did you say yes to this panel discussion? 
Gedanken? Für mich ist es der Triad von um, Money, Financials, um, um, say Financials, um, Information, Technology and Economics. And if we um, talk about um, money, it's like the central nerve system of the economy. And for me, uh, from scientific point of view and also um, economic uh, point of view, it's the most, uh, most interesting thing I could imagine. Ich kann share this view. Yeah. <laughs> um, last but not least, Mark Friedrich. You are a best-selling author of many books that aim at explaining the problems of the financial system to regular people, not only to economists. And um, so uh, I called you a couple of weeks ago, and so why did you uh, uh, said yes to this, to this occasion? Yeah? You were so incredibly charming. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's an it's a honor to be here. Um, <laughs> nah, he was, he was very friendly and persuasive. Um, it's an honor to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, why is it important? Because we need a new monetary system. Come on, let's look outside. Since 2008 we have problems. It's a historic problem and it's not solved. The only thing what happened since 2008 is that we experience a historic and unique central bank experiment which will fail, in my opinion. And we need an answer now, we need a plan B for the collapse of the euro, of the whole financial system, and we have to talk about it right now, because this will happen, this is just a matter of time. So let's stay at the uh, agenda of the conference and start with the current uh, money system, and I think, I don't remember which speaker it was, but he said, if we want to find alternatives, of course we first have to understand how the actual current money system works. So um, uh, maybe the first question to you, uh, Gerhard Schick. In the UK Parliament, um, it was a very interesting poll. Uh, it showed that at the end of two, uh, 2017, so this was not long ago, 85% of the MPs did not know how the current fractional reserve money system works and what banks actually do. So um, what do you think? Is this also representative for the German Parliament? And uh, what would be the consequences of such a high rate for policymaking in politics? Well, I don't want to um, say bad things about my colleagues, but um, I would not be surprised if the result in Germany was similar. Um, but it's true for the whole population and for many journalists, uh, etc. So it's not something that is only true for Parliament. Uh, Parliament, in that respect, is a representation of what happens in our society. And that makes monetary issues so um, easy to exploit politically. When there is a system that is very important and people don't really understand, then you can easily say with a target to discussion, for example, lead people in a certain tendency so what they think about it and make it basically a north against South European discussion. I think this is way too short as an analysis what goes is wrong in our monetary system, but that ha can easily happen when you have a misunderstanding what's actually going on. Then populists can easily exploit, and that's why I think it's very important to get to a better knowledge of our monetary system as it actually works today. That's, I see that as a great necessity uh, also for policymakers that want to uh, uh, make some policies that should help, but if they don't understand how the current money system works. Um, I see some difficulties, yeah. So, um, where do you personally see the problems in the current money system, Karl Christoph Hedrich? Uh, do you see any problems, or uh, do you see the ability of commercial banks to create money as credit as a problem? And, um, yeah, maybe that, that as a first question, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, we always should reflect upon the reasons of crises and where the real problems lie. But um, please allow me to be a bit sobering t tonight, because we have neglected a little bit today the reality of commercial banks. That are not investment banks you see in movies like Wall Street. We speak about the good banks and the core business of deposits and loans. And if I would tell 
the treasurer of Commerce Bank, what we have discussed today, he would say, oh, interesting, uh, but purely theoretical. I have to say that for a commercial bank today, it is simply impossible to expand loans in an infinite way. We have so much regulation now that it is not attractive and we cannot do that. It is not a Ferrari without brakes. We have brakes, capital requirements, liquidity ratios. Yeah? To, to create a loan and give a side deposit, that is maturity transformation. And then all these other regulations, liquidity leverage ratio, capital requirements, macro pro loan to value ratios, and for a bank, we should be cautious yeah, not to give too much loans. And what we should perhaps discuss a little bit more in detail is wrong incentives. For example, sovereign exposures. Yeah? It is indeed attractive to create money to, for an Italian bank to buy Italian bonds. That is extremely attractive. In Germany, you make losses by buying Bundeswertpapiere. Uh, That's the difference. And that shows us that central banks are enormously responsible for what they are doing and the incentives they set. Does that go in line with uh, what we were talking about? Because I remember you said um, decades ago the money system functioned quite well. Um, so what has happened after that? I remember that. Uh, you, you told me back in the days, in 60s, 70s, it worked quite well. Um, is that the case or did I get that wrong? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the second question. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm an old-fashioned conservative economist by education, <laughs> I have to admit. And so I, I wonder what Bundesbank did for 50 years. Uh, at least for 20 years or so, they tried to steer the monetary mass. And I think the mon quantity of money is indeed important. And what the Federal Reserve did was to lower interest rates for 20 years in a predictable way. That's the to yeah, inflation targeting is the opposite. So, uh, yeah, uh, there are simple means to restrict banks. Set a minimum reserve that is significantly high. This minimum reserve should not be interest free. Yeah? It, it should be interest yeah, zero interest, because then banks, it is costly for banks to hold minimum reserves. And, uh, for example, uh, you also should uh, not make full allotment of bank requirements for money. Yeah? That's, uh, money must be scarce and expensive. Every child is learning that. And full allotment is the opposite of that. Ralf Berliger, um, what are your issues you have with the current money system uh, from an Austria, Austrian school perspective? Yeah, um, if you think about uh, of a central bank um, as a lender of last resort, um, giving out credits is also always doing an investment, but um, without any um, private investors behind it who take the risk. So um, it's an, in a in a market economy, it's an anomaly that you have a so big um, planner, central planner in this economy. Normally, normally it, it, it does not fit to the free market. Um, um, it's an anomaly and it leads to misinvestments um, or bubbles like we have seen. Um, but it has um, historical reasons why um, we came to such a central bank system and um, it, in the past it, I think it was um, the best opportunity because um, if another opportunity had been better we had chosen it and today um, we will talk about um, new money, um, cryptocurrencies and we will see how they maybe can change the game. Okay, so you, you say uh, cryptocurrencies could be a possibility to um, get investors behind that and get like a completely market economy in the money sector. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so um, if you have, uh, 
ideas what <laughs> you want to say to that, please feel free to do so. Um, so, um, if there's not more, I would come back to Mark Friedrich, uh, because you became popular by explaining the many problems um, of the current financial money system to regular people in your best-selling books, and what is for you the biggest problem in the markets you see these days? Um, our current monetary system is just not working. We see that. We see it creates one bubble after another one. The central banks try to solve it with um, historic low interest rates and with a tsunami of money. And now they, they try to solve it with the same again. So it's like homeopathy. It's like, uh, like cures like. It's not working in, in, in the financial world in the monetary system. So our monetary system is in the end game, actually. And we need a solution for that. And we, we all feel it, I guess, since 2008. It was, a, it was a turning point, 2008, when the banks and the politics bailed out the financial industry, but there was no solution. The only thing they did, they printed money and bought ex expensive time on all our matter. We are, we're not getting any interest on our accounts, and it's getting more and more hard to save money for the retirement. And what we see, it's, it's, it's it's a monetary and central bank experiment, unique and historic. And um, I'm very curious where it leads to. So we need an, an answer. And I, I think um, different monetary systems will occur, of, of course. And I think, for example, Bitcoin is, 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 is one child of the financial crisis. And it has a potential to disrupt everything. And so, Mr. Heydrich, perhaps you will lose your job one day. but. Um, you can't stop progress. That's the thing. And um, we all will adapt to progress. And it's a big chance for, for humankind as well. It's my opinion. Mm -hmm. well, on the one hand, I, I think you are right. If you look at the, uh, the last decades, then we see that many things have, have gone wrong. On the other hand, um, the drama is maybe not that big for many people who see that the dollar is still has still purchasing power, the euro has still purchasing power. Uh, if you compare it with, with other countries like Venezuela or, or Argentina, there the situation is, is really dramatic. So in, in this We're terms, getting there, don't we, worry. We are, in, in this terms, we are, are um, claiming or, or on, on a high level about uh, these things. But, but anyway, uh, I think um, the, the, the events of the past have been quite uh, important to, to rethink the, the monetary system. And, and I think it, it is absolutely worth um, to think about uh, the role of, of cryptocurrencies in the, in the future. And what I find quite, quite interesting is uh, that uh, with the emergence of cryptocurrencies, central banks, well, it, it has acted quite as a catalyzer for central banks to think about um, digital currency, yes. the central bank digital currency. Um, and indeed, if, if central banks would be able to offer digital currency, then a, a big advantage of cryptocurrencies to make peer-to-peer -peer transactions would be also be offered. And uh, well, in German, you say a, a, a big chunk of wind would be taken out of the sale of, of, of cryptocurrency. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, providers, and and so. Uh, I think um, this is uh, certainly a good approach. Um, the other point that I mo want to make is that um, cryptocurrencies are maybe not that important for developed countries, but very important indeed for developing countries where you can see that every 10 years or so the uh, currency is debased and, and so far, we, we have to also to change somewhat our perspective uh, that um, cryptocurrency could be a very important issue for, for developing economies. Okay. Gajic? I just want to challenge the, the view of having um, s mon uh, money provided by government or by a central bank being uh, something weird in a market economy, not at all. We know that in a good market economy, there are collectively produced goods that help 
build the basis for a good market economy. That is true for our legal system. There are not competing legal system in most countries because it is helpful to have one to build the basis for market participants to, to compete. And the money system, I mean, that can be discussed, but I just want to say it's too easy to say that is something that doesn't work within a market economy. No, we have to discuss if money itself is a collective good and it's good to have it produced by governments to build the basis for the economy or if it should be something that where we allow competition because it's helpful for better results. I'm of the opinion that money is part of the basic infrastructure that we provide for market systems to work. I think currency competition is not a good thing. Um, that can work in parts of it. We have seen regional currencies, for example, but that's not real currency competition in the sense that Hayek uh, thought about it. Um, so just uh, to want to make sure that we don't uh, make that discussion too easy, just saying that's bad for a market economy. No, it's not that easy. Um, when when uh, talking about CBDC, I uh, really liked your argument because I think exactly the same way. Uh, I think cryptocurrencies actually paved the way for central banks to really look into it. Um, that's my opinion. I mean, Christine Lagarde uh, last week um, uh, made up uh, or gave a speech on that, and uh, the IMF produced a paper on that, an article. And also, Nouriel Roubini took that. Um, approach, so to say. He slashed cryptocurrencies, but he took the same approach. He said, okay, let's look at cryptocurrencies. Why shouldn't the central bank use that for a digital cash, even though central banks are not really looking into uh, using distributed ledger technology? Yeah? But I think uh, this is uh, actually really... I think, I think we all agree true. here that the next mon monetary system will be digital. I think it, it doesn't matter what you think about Bitcoin or, or um, central bank coins, but it will be digital, that's for sure. What was your stake, uh, what was your intention, uh, Mr. Schick, to ask the finance ministry and minister Olaf Scholz whether Germany should have a, a digital cash like the eKrona project of the Swedish central bank? And what was his answer and what do you think about this answer? Well, what can you do when you're in the opposition? Sometimes the only thing you can do is to stimulate a discussion and make sure at least we talk about some issues. Um, and in that case, I tried to bring the debate about our monetary system into the Financial Committee of Bundestag um, with a report by the ministry that could be a basis for a good discussion. Well, um, they wrote some good pages, that's okay. Um, and I think uh, it was helpful to see their thoughts of it talking about advantages, disadvantages, and I think this is a tremendous change that is in front of us, so I think it is okay for a ministry not to say, oh yeah, let's go for it, but look at advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. So I thought for a first approach for a finance committee to discuss about it, okay. Um, the discussion later on in the committee, hmm, we still have to work on that. Um. Dr. Christoph Hedrich, Karl Christoph Hedrich, we met each other on that event on CBDC. And what uh, I remember is our first uh, words that we changed, so to say, was, okay, this guy did not talk about retail CBDC, but only about wholesale re CBDC. So retail would be like a CBDC, a central bank digital cash for the non-banks. And um, Forgive me, I forgot the name of the manager of the BIS. Um, he, on, he only talked about wholesale uh, CBDC. So what is your position on a retail CBDC? We have all heard the talks about today. Uh, would that be a threat for commercial banks? No, I, I just have to remark that uh, it is not about stopping uh, progress. Yeah? Uh, it's my arguments are just in favor of an evolutionary approach instead of disruptive revolution. And to, to get it, things right, I sh think we should reflect before we decide upon such a radical change. So uh, of course, uh, also commercial banks are in favor of these, um, or interested in these new means of payment. So the, as I mentioned, uh, 
the crucial question is, uh, do we create a level playing field or not? Do we set the incentives right? And if you ask me about peer-to-peer uh, -peer digital money, uh, I can say, okay, it's, it's a question of competition. But first, we should answer these important questions. Privacy, know your customer, for example, a bank is not allowed to, to do anything with anybody without knowing him. And that's right, it's okay, so money laundering <laughs> and all these questions we should discuss first. And then we can say, okay, let's introduce peer-to-peer -peer, peer retail digital money. But if a central bank did that, it would certainly include all these aspects, right? Yes, it is a public good. Yeah? If, if it is organized well and we can uh, be confident that our private data are in, in good hands, it's okay. Yeah? okay. But uh, it, if, if we have heard an argument this afternoon that, the in, that uh, these digital money should be interest-bearing, it's okay. Yeah? It's an incentive. It's a question of competition between private providers of digital money. But I think it's dangerous to say that the central bank digital money that is competing with private should have the same interest rate like the private money. And then we have no chance. Every, this is a wrong incentive, as I mentioned. It is attractive for all of you, of us, to transfer our cash or digital money, our deposits to the central bank. And we are living in times of fake news and, uh, yeah, and uh, volatile public opinion. Yeah, you can read a lot of things about, also about Commerce Bank that are not true. And, uh, and in such a case, I think, be careful what you are doing not to create virtual bank runs or something like that. Yeah, well, well I think that the main question that we have to, to answer is that do we can really increase the wel welfare of the economy? Do we can increase the welfare of the people? And uh, I think that given that uh, so much life or the reality is happening on the internet, it is the logical consequence that we have a mean of payments which goes really directly through the internet, so peer-to-peer -peer through the internet. And I would be rather without any ideological blinkers uh, looking for a solution for that, and this could be a private solution, this could be also a public solution in my view. If the central bank can offer uh, a central bank money, digital currency, which works, why not? So uh, I would not say, well, it cannot work because it's a state. No, it can, it can work, um, but uh, that has to be, be analyzed. Well, the problem is that then the state or the central bank has all our data. And uh, I'm not happy about this. We are tracked uh, at every corner whenever we go into the... So internet. better Amazon has it. <laughs> uh, that's exactly the point. Uh, yeah, that's exactly the point. Uh, the other problem is, uh, and that's really a dystopian... Uh, uh, um, today you call this narrative in the banking sector. Um, a dystopian uh, uh, narrative would be uh, that Amazon and uh, uh, Alphabet uh, or whoever else, uh, that, they, uh, uh, that they are really competing with uh, um, when maybe uh, our, our financial system at the moment is ruined. And, um, and then we, we have to deal with these uh, currencies and, 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 and that's also, also very bad. Mm. But so about bo both yeah. alternatives uh, are really not uh, pleasurable. But this may be also a design issue. Um, that what does uh, it mean? Uh, how to design this, the CBDC. So um, I think that there are possibilities and I, I understood so uh, some um, presentations here so that a kind of an anonymity could be mm. possible, especially with a value-based um, <laughs> CBDC. Um, so I think that, well, this is also an aspect of the welfare, of, obviously. So the, the uh, Ecrona uh, project uh, is actually working on that. They say that uh, low denominations of money should be able to be transferred anonymously up to, let's say, I don't know, 500 euros. And all the rest needs to be registered, so account-based, and the, the, up to 500 should be value-based to make sure that you are really having a cash equivalent that is anonymously, so to say. Yeah. So, um, 
Ralf äh, Belliger, äh, we were talking about uh, the application of distributed ledger technology and you also said that in some years you expect the euro on the ledger. So um, Christine Lagarde used that path and took up the movement in the cryptocurrency space and said, hey, central banks, look into the new technology. Why don't you use it? Do you believe that will come? Probably because um, central banks um, are forced by the competition um, to offer such a money. If I have advantages with um, um, cryptocurrencies, um, they are more easy to transfer. I have not to trust any third party. Um, if central bank banks want to um, persist in competition, they are also forced um, to make such an offer. And um, if they do, um, they have to show trustworthy that probably that um, the amount of money is stable or it's technically guaranteed um, that the amount of money um, cannot be extended like they want, maybe 4% each year or so. Uh, and also the question of data protection has to be solved. Um, we know um, at um, existing blockchain solutions, we have zero knowledge proof um, where um, I, I cannot, which are anonymous, and um, if central bank can um, make such an offer um, and can persist uh, in the competition, um, they will um, launch their own money. Yeah. So uh, let's get to the, the to the next slot, so to say, the sovereign money slot. Uh, I mean, CBDC could lead to such a system. Um, so. Um, Mr. De La Rubia and Mr. Hedrich, uh, two questions to you, because I think it was very imp impressive and very uh, interesting to read the two statements of your uh, bank, so to say. Uh, one was written by you um, personally, and one was written by the chief economist of, uh, commercial, uh, of uh, Commerzbank. And they both gave a report on the sovereign uh, money uh, initiative in Switzerland. And yours was, I believe, quite progressive. It was, uh, you highlighted the pros, you highlighted the cons, but said it's a very interesting thing and you should look into it. Uh, Commerzbank said it's political money. So maybe you could give some insights into, into these reports or why you chose to wrote in uh, uh, the style you did. Okay, so may I start? Um, yeah, well, given that, that we had uh, all those problems uh, in the past, I think one should be open-minded to new approaches, and, and I think Folgeld could be a, a good approach. Um, having said that, uh, one must be aware for which countries uh, such an approach could apply. I think it could apply to all those countries where people trust in the institutions um, of the issuing of the, of the monetary authority, um, it is much more difficult to uh, apply such a system to countries where there is no trust in monetary uh, authorities because of, of a history of hyperinflation and so on. Um, but if you have such a, such a trust in the system, um, then um, I think uh, it, it's worth to think about it. And, and um, there are some serious papers from IMF and uh, also uh, back to the 30s from Aaron Fisher who uh, analyzed this concept, uh, modeling it and, and come to the conclusion that it could very well work. So in this respect it, it has to be taken serious. Um, yeah, that's it. Your, your turn, your, your view on that. Yeah, of, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I am more or less uh, of the same uh, opinion like Jörg Kramer, uh, but it's only one argument. You know, this was in the FAZ, uh, uh, this very short article he has written. So, uh, yeah, the question is, is it political money or not? I think uh, if you decide to introduce full money or whatever in such a kind as we discussed today, uh, the crucial question is, can you really guarantee or install a fully independent institution that is not tempted to obey to political expectations or of the yeah the public, and uh, even yeah and, and we know that uh, even a fully independent central bank can obey yeah to these expectations by 
yeah, following a loose monetary policy concept. And so uh, it is a democratic problem here, yeah? how to create an institution that is completely independent and that is responsible for the money creation. And that would be the case. Yeah? Central banks would be much more involved in steering the economy. They might have to be elastic in the money supply. Yeah? And they are responsible for the business cycle much more than they are responsible for creating side deposits. So, and that is, uh, yeah, very, very difficult. And I do not know the answer. Uh, perhaps we will end up with the political money. Mr. Schick, do you have an answer? <laughs> well, it, just to say that um, for a political process, it's very complicated to say, on the one hand, there is a problem with our monetary system and current central banks are creating a problem. And then to propose a solution that gives the same central bank that you criticize even more power. As a political strategy that usually doesn't work. That is my experience. And we see already an accumulation of power in central banks. The European Central Bank has, as today, with banking supervision and monetary policy and the role it has had in the uh, Troika on, on Greece, etc., an enormous conf uh, accumulation of conflicts of interest. So um, we should um, discuss that, how that can work. Um, and I think um, there is a specific, um, the, the, the second problem attached uh, with uh, Folgeld is we cannot expect that all the problems with creation of money are solved uh, with that proposal. There are many near monies and financial products that create part of the bubble. It's not only the central bank that does. And that will not go away. And sometimes in the discussion I miss the link to financial market regulation. Then there needs to be a combination of approaches, and it's not only the monetary question, it's a combination of, of both. And that only then can you hope to have a less bubbling and a boom and bust uh, economy in the future. Um, but we shouldn't forget that the most money which is created in our f um, fractional reserve system right now is by commercial banks. It's like 90% or something, so um, we would give back the power to the central banks, which would be um, elected perhaps by the people. And um, so I think it's, it's worth a shot to um, think about an alternative, because the banks, they have a privilege to create money out of thin air, and they use it. And every time it comes to a speculation and to a bubble, and then we, the people, have to bail them out and pay the, the debts. That's the problem with our actual um, current fractional reserve system, which is just not working. And of course, the banks doesn't want to give away the, this privilege because it's, it's very profitable, of course. Yeah? Um, but that we're here already, it's a sign that we all feel we have to change something. And uh, I think with the next crisis, I guess, we we forced to think about alternatives. Is there a view of... of the commercial bank representatives on that here? That would be a very interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah. If I may uh, yeah. answer, uh, yes, of course you are right, but uh, in fact I think Thank banks you. are only part of the problem. Yeah. If we are in the middle of the transmission process, starting with central bank money, then we create indeed money to the M3 or whatever aggregate you choose. And then, I fully agree, come capital markets that have invented a trick 20 years ago or so, with uh, securitization or so, subprime and whatever, to multiply <coughs> further what you call money. And uh, I mentioned the brakes of the Ferrari before. Banks now are so much regulated, I think. Uh, we would be glad or happy to give more loans in Germany. Yeah? We are ready to do it. There is no demand. Yeah, we depend upon demand. Yeah? Loans are given only on demand of customers, we should not forget. Yeah? We are not, yeah? and greedy bankers 
you see in Wall Street movies. We have also, yeah, we are also greedy, I know, but it is very difficult to be greedy in a saving bank. Thank thing. you. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Got it on tape. <laughs> we, need, we depend upon demand. So, and capital markets, I think, are crucial to regulate. And uh, perhaps you are, choose, uh, you are chasing the wrong beast. Or in the wrong, yeah, it's a full guilt uh, adherence at Not least. I mean, uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, or, 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 or the smaller one, because yes, it, uh, shadow banks have been discussed here. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that the next crisis will come from the blind spot. Okay, Don't see. where's the blind spot? Uh, I mean, from a scientific point of view, it's absolutely evident. Uh, and for example, uh, if you take mainstream economists like Brunnermeier and Schnabel, and they have shown that major financial crisis always depended on too much credit. How, do, how does too much credit originate? By the banks. Why? Why are the banks, uh, why can the banks do this? Answer, because they, they have this pri privilege uh, of, of, of money, uh, money creation. And, and that's, that's without, without doubt. And when you argue, well, but we have the shadow banks, okay, then we have to regulate the shadow banks. I mean, this is an absolute incorrect uh, uh, way of, of, of argument. I'm sure that people who work in banks, that they are interested to, uh, 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 to lose this privilege, sure. But then you should say it. And, and, and you should not go to, to another playing ground and say, well, but the shadow banks, and this is our destiny, we can't do anything, so uh, leave us our privilege, etc. I mean, uh, uh, this shows to me, and, and you say, well, we have done such a lot of things, and, 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 and uh, we are in chains. I mean, the leverage ratio is 3% in, and it's not binding. This is ridiculous. When you argue that this is enough or relevant, then I can't take you serious. Sorry. I mean, 3% and it's not binding. That's almost nothing. Yeah. yeah. But he said so. You should, you should applaud. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love his passion. And he's absolutely right. Yeah, we all should re really listen to him. And I think BlackRock, for example, is a big problem. Of course, it's a shadow bank, and they're in charge of 5.5 trillion dollars. Um, if it would be a country, it would be the third most powerful country in the world um, by GDP. And um, they have very nice stuff on the on the computers as well, Aladdin and everything. So they're in charge of 20 trillion actually. So. We, we have a problem with the with with financial sector which is not working anymore. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's like a cancer. Yeah? And everybody knows it's a problem, but in 2008, politics was not brave enough to go to the real reason of the problem. There were, I don't know, perhaps the crisis um, uh, disappeared too fast because the cheap money worked pretty fast, or they were just not brave enough to look at the root of the problem, and it is the monetary system. It's how the banks create money out of thin air. And there are a couple of poli uh, politics, like you, for example, who really know how, how money works and how it's created, and that banks can create bank money out of thin air, out of nothing. But I think 90% of the colleagues, I guess, have no clue. Or what do you think? Well, we had that question before, but I want to refer to a distinction you made that I think important for the debate. Is the change of the monetary system, introduction of Vollgeld, something one would propose as a reform project today? Or is it something we have in the desk for a restart if something bad happens? When it came to the referendum in Switzerland, I was not sure what I wanted as a result. And finally, I said, well, I think it would be good to have a high score in favor, which is well below the 50%. So to stimulate the discussion, but not introduce it the next day. Because was I would have feared that it would the time is not ripe, and the preparations are not well in place to do it. So I would think preparing it, discussing it, is important, but not making it a political project now. And the second point is important. Often in political discussions, I hear, have the result when I speak about financial market reform, that people say, well, this is all negligible. The 
mother of all reforms, the real reform we have to do is reforming the monetary system. And I think what we learned today and what should be considered it is that without financial market reform concerning shadow banks, money market fund, for example, the change in the monetary system will not have the desired effect. And without certain adaptions of the monetary system, financial market regulation alone will not have the desired effect either. And that shows we should bring the debates more together and not one against each other if we want to stabilize the system. But um, <laughs> may I ask you, uh, let's, let's assume there are some uh, other regulations uh, uh, concerning financial markets plus uh, uh, positive money and for the, mo at, uh, for the moment uh, we forget uh, about the realisticness uh, at, at the moment. Uh, did I understand I you? I never forget about that, I'm a politician. <laughs> Uh, not, uh, not for very long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I dare ask you, uh, did you argue some minutes ago that, that, that nevertheless it will be more or less uh, uh, inefficient? Is, is this your point? What or would you... Uh, 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 positive money reform. Or is your point, let's, let's wait for it, and with other reforms it may make sense. What is your opinion on this? Well... My point is, alone, it will not be sufficient to make for a stable system. And the point I made before is, I don't see how the political project will work right now. And um, I think we should, we should prepare for the question, how could it be implemented? Can it be implemented only at an international level? What are steps? What are the precise conditions? How a central bank would need to work in the case of positive money? Because steering that requires a different central bank than that one we have today. And I think the separation from banking regulation becomes all the more important to avoid conflicts of interest. So, because if at a central bank, at the same time you want to avoid the bankruptcy of banks. On, on the other hand, you're responsible for de establishing the quantity of credit that is available and of business that banks can do. I mean, this is an inherent conflict of interest that's even larger than the one you have today. So there are still a lot of questions to be solved. So today, I would not vote yes in a referendum on Folgeld. I would not, because we're not prepared yet. Mm. So. We've uh, heard about the problems of the current money system. We've talked about Vollgeld. Um, I have to think back of, to the um, presentation of Dominic Schiener here from IOTA, for example. And he said, uh, also Philip Sandner said, that there are thousands of people actually working on solutions in the crypto space. So um, they see the problems. And uh, what they think is, OK, we can complain. We can wait until another system occurs but let's get together and let's work on something. So um, I think this is a, an interesting approach on that. Is that approach, that's may, may, maybe a question to all of you, is that approach a feasible approach for you in the money system, in the monetary system? So it leads to the question, will cryptocurrencies eventually bring out a more stable monetary system? Um, due to many people working on it and uh, trying to find solutions and you know there's a big market there's a lot of people working on that so yeah long 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 question um, hopefully I'll get some answers if you um, may I start <clears throat> I think so it's um, like I said it's actually a direct result of the financial crisis as a Bitcoin for example and there are so many people working um, as volunteers on the, for example, on the Bitcoin um, core development team to create a better and more democratic um, monetary system which is decentralized, which is limited, peer-to-peer, um, -peer, borderless, so many positive aspects actually on this system which is much better um, than our current monetary system. So I think the, 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 the masses of the people are very intelligent 
and they have um, no own interest in it, like okay, like a company or a central bank or something, because it's for the people. So I think it has a big, big, pretty big chance to be successful. I think Bitcoin will stay here. There are 99% of, of, of cryptocurrencies which are not working, have no use case, um, are scam or whatever. Um, but a couple of them will survive. You have to imagine it's like the internet in the, in the 90s. There were so many um, companies on the Nasdaq, at the Nasdaq.com bubble, like um, uh, let's, let's play.com or whatever, and they all disappeared. But we have to find the Amazons and the Ebays in this in this crypto space, and there will be a couple of them. So, and I think Bitcoin is one of them. But will it become money? Because yes, it already is. It, it's it it already is money. You can use it as money, and it's like gold. It's like a store of value right now. You can use Bitcoin. You can buy your coffee or your pizza or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's not it, really a good way of money, though, because I mean, money no, is it's, measured usually. No, it's very volatile. It's, it's very volatile. Exactly, and it's measured in these three functionalities: medium of exchange, uh, unit of account, and then store of value. Yes. And none of these are actually. Give it some time. It's very early. We are really in the early stage of a prep and, and money how, revolution. How should, it, how should that evolve over time? That's, I think, very There's interesting. so many people working worldwide, for example, on Lightning, which is a, uh, which is a, a second layer um, architecture on the Bitcoin blockchain. There is there, there are smart contracts, for example. There are so many clever people working on the progress of the blockchain for Bitcoin. We mm -hmm. will see some development in the next couple of years, but it won't happen overnight. I find it quite interesting uh, that uh, in these foundations of Ethereum or IOTA uh, or the development team of Bitcoin, which is not governed very strictly, but, but is more anarchic, I have the feeling, but, but it happens also quite a lot, uh, that at, uh, especially in the, in the foundation of Ethereum, a lot of progress is being done and, and it encounters the the let's say the capitalistic approach that everybody is for his own and and there must be an incentive an individual incentive to do something so this is i think quite quite a positive development also and i i, th I think that the blockchain technology uh, is also fostering this cooperation uh, for example also cooperation between banks so uh, jp morgan has has uh, an ethereum based uh, quorum blockchain which uh, should enable um, international uh, transfers of money and i think that some i don't know 70 banks or something like that have joined this platform and are working together to 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 enable these these uh, payments and so these are this is a permission blockchain, so it's not an open blockchain, so the private sector is still more open for permission blockchain than, than for the open ones. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the technology itself is fostering uh, cooperation, and um, this, I think, will be also a, a big, important part of the future. What is, uh, or what I was wondering is, uh, in the German parliament, is, DLT or b b blockchain technology, is that a topic? Are there discussions about it? Are there policies being made or discussed about making policies about that? Uh, are the MPs aware of the technology? In the last, uh, prior to the last election of 2017, my answer would have been almost not. Um, since the election, there has been progress. There are more people working on that uh, in Parliament right now in different fields. I mean, it has uh, impact in, in various fields of policy. And I think we're, as a Parliament, trying to catch up. Perhaps not fast enough, not good enough, but uh, yes, there are various people now uh, trying to speed up the discussion. If, if I may, I just uh, of to course. correct perhaps uh, the image I have given here this evening uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Commerce Bank is extremely active in blockchain technology and developing solutions, but uh, our selection we got uh, so far is that we should concentrate upon feasible smaller solutions. We are not active in creating money. And creating money is a temptation for everybody, and so we should be extremely cautious in this issues. 
Yeah, but there are a lot of solutions that are very valuable in daily business of banks and financial markets that you can uh, realize very soon. So uh, that makes a difference, and that's what I try to, to do here. We differentiate, uh, differentiate it, uh, we, we appreciate and differentiate it argumentation and not to use a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Okay. Well, uh, I have some difficulties to see the advantages of uh, blockchain in retail banking, for example. I mean, you, you have this, uh, from a formal point of view, this decentralization. But uh, from a substantial point of view, when you have a look at Bitcoin, cash, etc., etc., what's going on there, and, and who are the, the big miners, and what are the alternatives uh, for, uh, to, uh, to do this mining, you know? Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is from a democratic and from an economic point of view such an advantage. When, when you try to save uh, money, um, uh, uh, and you have uh, you you put a contract on the blockchain, then you don't know because when you put it on the blockchain, if this is a legal contract, uh, uh, you you don't know this, and 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 when you have problems of interpretation, you can't ask your blockchain. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure if this exclusion of trust uh, and human communication, what you so nicely uh, underlined, and hopefully banks do that uh, today. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if there are so many advantages, and there, there are disadvantages. I mean, obviously, uh, for, for, for eternity, uh, uh, your transactions uh, are noted, and transparency is may, um, that's fine. But maybe I do not want uh, to have transparency uh, uh, for, for my uh, transactions 20 years ago. Well, well, for banks, uh, transparency is required in, in many ways. Know your customer is, is one big issue for banks. <clears throat> and the blockchain technology, um, well, I don't want to get into, into technical issues, but, but the blockchain technology provides a possibility to, to have a ledger which is very f could, uh, where you could see very fast uh, for, if you look for one customer, what transaction ha has he done? And so you can uh, follow on on, on this uh, know your customer uh, issue. And, and so in this sense, one use, use case is this um, banks say, okay, blockchain could be an interesting technology. So I would suggest we wrap it up here. Um, it's been one hour, 45 minutes was planned, but I think it was worth it. Uh, uh, so Gerhard Schick needs to go. If there are some questions to the others, uh, we can do that if you are still ready to have them. Uh, but anyways, I want to say thank you to Mr. Schick that he joined us here. Um, and maybe we give a, a big applause to the, to the podium right now. And if there are some questions we could do, um, Otherwise, we have uh, still some drinks outside uh, to get uh, in touch and network again. And um, okay, so there's one. Could okay. I'll. We have kind of. I just want to address the elephant in the room. I started a question in nine uh, in 2013 at a uh, conference with the uh, panel uh, where Mr. Andrew Jain was, uh, still the co-manager uh, of the Deutsche Bank. And uh, when I asked him if the, uh, that does the Deutsche Bank uh, um, <clears throat> create money out of thin air, he denied and he said, no, we are turning savings to capital. Now we are here standing and we have the situation that this is no longer denied. And I put the, the second question, if this is the case, if banks are creating money out of thin air, should it be regulated? So I'm asking the panel now, should it be regulated? And then I asked in which direction? And that's my question, once again. Actually, it is regulated. Um, so we can discuss if it is regulated enough, but, but actually if, if uh, a loan is extended, then uh, you have as a bank to provide for enough qu equity, which is covering this, uh, this loan. And, and uh, there, um, Martin Helwig, for example, says it's not enough. 
we should uh, uh, regulate the banks so that uh, much more equity is provided so that if the loan uh, goes insolvent then the bank does not go bankrupt immediately but has this buffer uh, so we can discuss about that but uh, there is regulation indeed um, after the euro crisis in 2011 the ecb uh, reduced the mindestreservesatz was it called in english no, minimum, minimum reserve. reserve from two percent to one percent to explain it it's like um when you want a loan for i don't know an apartment in frankfurt 35 square meters it's about two million euros um then you um the bank has only to take one percent in in real money in central bank money to the ecb and can create the rest out of it 99 percent out of thin air this is very important to know they reduced it during the stress during the uh, crisis with greece and the euro from two to one percent and this is not healthy Just, it, it won't help uh, the funny thing is uh, hans uh, that uh, the elephant is still in the economic textbooks uh, I, I made uh, research for two years now and I checked uh, 60, 70 uh, macroeconomic textbooks and uh, all of them, uh, except Buffinger, mm -hmm. uh, um, they explained it uh, uh, in, in, the, in the wrong way. So they have this money multiplier story with a certain causality running from the central bank uh, to, to the uh, credits of, of, the, uh, uh, of the banks. That's, that's very interesting. Th there are heterodox textbooks, but in Germany and in Europe, uh, they are uh, anathema, you know, they, they, are, they are not known. They are very nice textbooks, but... And, and the students, our young students, you know, their, their, their initial uh, imprint uh, uh, consists in, in, in a wrong story. I, and I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. Yep. Uh, in physics, uh, uh, with GPS, you know, you would not go, uh, uh, could not turn around the next corner w without an accident. Uh, just to mention, your biggest victory has been Bundesbank. Bundesbank has changed its mind after one year of discussion, and you can see it in the museum. Yeah, and there is a full explanation that banks can ma create money out of nothing. And in the monthly report of April last year, you can read it. As a, you, you, you have convinced Deutsche Bundesbank, and that is enough. <laughs> That's not chapeau, enough. chapeau, yeah. danke, Herr Schaub. First step. You <laughs> so I'd go for one last question, if there is one. Very short last question. Yeah, yeah, from, yeah, up here, this young man. Yeah, I'm wondering if equity regulation is really so important because in a boom, when asset prices go up, the banks uh, mark their assets in their, in their trading book to market and then they will have more equity so they can make more loans and so on. So is, uh, is equity regulation really so important? And by the way, um, uh, I read that uh, Barclays uh, created in, in a way, uh, its own capital by making a loan to an investment fund and they bought uh, new preferred shares from Barclays. <laughs> good question. Yeah. Very good question, very good question, but you may answer. I try to answer. <laughs> if you can better, please. No, no, no. As, there are very difficult arguments, and you are right, it is not, only in not always a restricting factor, but you, we, we speak about bank-owned capital, yeah? That is the, the share capital issued by the bank. And a commercial bank cannot issue infinitely uh, new capital, yeah? And so that it is restricting, but we have other breaks. I all mentioned them, yeah? I do not want to bore you. But uh, there are liquidity ratios and so on, and restricted demand. And so it, it, we, we, are, we should not create too much loans out of nothing, because then we will have non-performing loans in a couple of years from now. And then the bank will be unprofitable. And that it, it, a risk manager should have a long-term perspective. And that what we have perhaps neglected here, yeah, in Europe, we have, a long, we have had a long-term culture, you can say, with the old HGB uh, accounting standards. Yeah? And we have introduced Anglo-Saxon methods here, yeah? that coming from investment banks from the United States, with very short-term 
perspectives, interest in the next quarterly results, and that is wrong. Let's take this as the last words everybody can uh, agree on. <laughs> so I really want to thank you all for uh, participating in this panel. I want to thank all of you for staying that long and uh, listening to all these talks and uh, discussions.